Hello, everybody. I didn't write my name in the slides. I'm Javier Pivas. Uh, maybe you already know me. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for organizing this amazing conference. Um, today, I'm going to talk about a little bit about compilers and uh, well, Sonic means C of Node inlining compilers, right? And this is uh, this is just a buzzword or a uh, code name for something I've been working on with the team in, in Quorum. Okay, you hear me better. Um, so I have been working on this project for a little while and, uh, well, it's mostly about what I've been learning there because uh, it's a quite complex topic, compilers, inlining compilers, optimizing compilers, and C of Node compilers, graph-based compilers. So I'm just going to basically present the basic ideas there and, well, Maybe you will get interested a little bit on that. Maybe you want to collaborate or something like that. So why first, right? Um, compiler technology has been evolving a lot uh, in the past, I don't know, since they were invented like in, back in the, in the 50s, right? So uh, in the case of Smalltalk, uh, the most advanced compilers uh, were being built in the 80s. And after that, well, self team uh, took over the edge and they started developing more advanced compilers than what we have in Smalltalk. Then Java also evolved that. And uh, finally, JavaScript also did that. And we have been lacking there. So they have transformed into the research vehicles um, for things that have to do uh, with dynamic languages and we are basically slower and uh, we don't have the implementation so we, we have no small talk that does for example C of nodes uh, or graph based intermediate representation for compilers and we also have the knowledge because most people that works in small talk doesn't uh, really know how to write this kind of compilers and uh, also we still don't have the money but that's a matter of time we will have all that money um, but it's it's important and why it's important right well first of all Moore's law is not evolving as much as we would like especially in sequential processing so if you have a GPU you can add more cores but if you are doing sequential programming then well, you basically have to make your code run faster in the same processor that is not be, uh, becoming faster that much. And the other thing is that we are becoming, we are coming into an era where you can execute everywhere. So you, you need technology for uh, opening code for different platforms. You might need to transpile. You need a lot of things there. So we need better compilers if we want to be up to the task in the future. Uh, so this will be my running example. I haven't yet made this understand, my compiler at least, understand that this is the same than this, right? It seems easy, well, but it's not that easy. You all, you all can see that we are assigning two variables with self class, so the result for that has to be true, right? But how can a, a virtual machine or a compiler uh, get to understand that they are really the same thing and then uh, write something else and not perform the computation if it's not needed? So that's the topic of this talk. So what, what does a compiler do when we accept a method? Well, basically, it parses the source code and generates an AST, right? The, I think most people that does small talk is familiar with that idea. We generate a tree that basically models what the method has. So you have the method node, and there you have a sequence, a sequence of instructions. Like maybe you are assigning a variable, and what you are assigning is basically a message send, the results of a message send, and that message send is being sent to self. Right, so that's the first uh, statement, and then you have one other statement which is basically the same but assigning to y. Well, I should have written y, 
And then finally, you have to return the result of the expression x, y, i, right? So you have that kind of things. But, well, what does the compiler do with this? Well, it could give that back to the VM so that it could execute it. But usually what it does is to generate bytecodes that basically model what this method do, does in a more compressed format. So how do these bytecodes look like? Well, basically, you will have, for example, a SAC machine where you are going to push the receiver and the arguments, and then you are going to send the messages and return the, the results in the stack. So you will push self, then you will send the message to what is in the top of the stack, then you will pop that into some instance variable or a temporary variable, sorry, and then you will do the same for the second uh, the second part, here it says x again, sorry. And then you are going to send the message equals equals and then finally return. So, okay, this is okay for execution, but it's not that okay for transforming the program or for understanding why x should be the same than x. Uh, okay, so... Let's get into the optimizing compilers world. Again, we have this method, and what the optimizing compiler does is to generate something that is called an intermediate representation. You know, the bytecodes can be considered an, an intermediate representation, the ASC could be considered an intermediate representation, but what the optimizing compiler does is a little bit different. So what you would have here is something that has some information about the code, but not exactly as a tree. Uh, in this case, what we have are some instructions and some other thing, which is called a basic block, right? So a basic block is basically a list of instructions that get executed, at least virtually, um, linearly, right? Because you have a sense they are so there, so maybe there's something happening in the back, but you basically see that you are executing one message send, then the other, then the other, then you finished, right? So that's a possible intermediate representation. And if you have any branches, if you have to take different branches, like if you have an if true, if false, then you will, you will put the instructions in the corresponding basic blocks that you get to generate, right? But again, well, the compiler with this cannot optimize too much because it's just sending two messages which are general, like class, who knows what class is. So it cannot optimize anything. So the first thing an optimizing compiler usually does is to start aligning things, right? So let's align the first message class. And let's, uh, let's, let me uh, lie a little bit to you. So let's think that the, um, that the compiler already knows what the method class is going to be because you're sending a message. It could be anything, but let me convince you for a while that it's going to uh, find this method, which is a primitive, and internally it does this, right? So it, it asks, which kind of object are we pointing to? If the object is a small integer, Usually it's tagged and it's not in the heap because that saves memory. So if you want to know the class, you, f you first check if it's, um, if it's tagged and if it's tagged, then you know it's a small integer. If it's not tagged, then you go look at the pointer and fetch the class from there. So what does it mean to align the message? Well. You can see it with code. It's not exactly what the compiler does, but if you look at the code, then you can see that here we have two class messages that we are sending and the compiler would do the equivalent of this. So where we have self class, now we have the whole code of the original implementation of class, right? So now we have two times the same thing. And now the compiler is more or less approaching to the truth, right? It's approaching to the, yeah, sorry. When Yen is not said this tag, but said this epoch is considered only end. 
insects. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, no problem. I like people that ask questions in my own. Yeah, especially if they are wrong. No, I, I look smarter. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, we have aligned the code, right? And now the compiler can do more things. So let's again look at the intermediate representation for this code that has been um, updated. Now, we have in, in the left, we have what they had in the right. So let's start to look at the intermediate representation. We have a basic block in the beginning. Should do this, sorry. So we have this basic block, which asks if uh, the thing is tagged, and then it's going to branch, right? If it's tagged, it's going to return, well, it's going to assign y to, uh, sorry, x to the small integer class, and if not, it's going to look at the header class stored in the heap. So we have two branches. And then uh, what it's going to do in, in both cases is going to, uh, to jump into another basic block that is going to ask if y is tagged, if, sorry, if self is tagged, right? And then it's going to branch again and it's going to assign y with one of those cases. And then finally it's going to branch to the showing point again and it's going to ask if they are equal and return. And now we can see that, well, the compiler has added a little few things. It has added some temporaries, right? We have there T1, T2, T3. So it's something that it makes up while processing so that it can talk about uh, temporal values. And well, it, it also modified the, the assignment of X so that we are assigning X uh, in for example, in two cases, if you look at instruction number three and instruction number four, they're both uh, assigning X while the original wasn't, right? It was assigning X only once. But this is something the compiler can do. But the problem is that, well, you don't really want to, uh, to do that because, well, you have then to take into account all the places where X is being assigned and where um, Y is being assigned you have to keep a table there, and if you want to know what is being assigned, well, you have to do an indirection. Look at the table, see where the instruction that assigned is, and look at the value. So, what usually compilers do, optimizing compilers, but traditional optimizing compilers, is they just say, okay, so let's add a new instruction. We're going to call it phi, and what phi is going to give us so we are going to remove all the names for the temporaries. And when we have something like with X, what we are going to do is just assign the result of both branches to a new pseudo instruction, which is called phi. So here we have phi, right? So phi basically means that if we are coming from the, uh, from the branch in the left, then we have to take instruction three, which was a small integer. And if not, we have to take the load. Well, that's basically what a phi does. It helps us a little bit because now x is only assigned once in all the code. So if we use x, we already know what's the value of x. It's the value of phi, right? We have to afterwards think about what that means because it's, it's like if you came from here, it's some value. If you came from the other side, it's another value. But it's good for our intermediate representation because each um, input to, uh, to an instruction is always only one value and not something that comes from a table. And, well, then we have the branch again, right? And we can keep improving. So, we are talking about basic blocks, right? And we are talking about names, but we could, instead of using names, we could also directly make the instructions point to the instructions that generate the values that those instructions originally needed. What does that mean? So, for example, here we have, in the left again, we have what we had before, and now we are going to say, okay, what's the first thing that is calculated? It's tagged. 
right? So we are going to have a node for that. So what does that node need to be calculated? It needs self. So in order to calculate self, well, you need to have another node that represents self. And then, well, if the result is true, then we are going to generate an node of value small integer. And if false, we are going to generate a load, right? So if you look at the dependencies or the inputs of each thing that we just created, they are the small integer doesn't have any dependency because it's a it's a a constant, right? It doesn't have any input. On the case of the load, you have that the load depends, well, of course, on self, because it has to load something pointed by, by self and an offset, which is another constant. Right? So the, this constant class offset is stored in the same basic block than the load because, well, basically you are going to use it there. It could have been put on the basic block on the top because you could generate that value before branching and then you could use it only on that branch. And so afterwards you would join, right? And again, the fee value depends on the small integer and the load. But also, of course, it depends on the basic blocks, right? So I, I draw a different colored arrow there because we have that this instruction points to other instructions, other nodes, but also points to other basic blocks. So we have instructions that can point to basic blocks and we have instructions that, sorry, to other nodes and we have instructions that can point to basic uh, to nodes and to basic blocks, right? So that's a little bit awkward because we are having different types of things being pointed by the same thing, which are the inputs of instructions. And so again, we look at the second uh, part and in the end, we just compare if the uh, if the fee in the in the first uh, join is equal to the second fee in the se in the second join, and then we return that. Okay, so you can see how we have passed from something that was the bike or something very linear to something that gets converted uh, uh, one step to the other to something that starts to look like a graph, right? And what we haven't uh, yet modeled here is what happens to the loads, right? Because these loads are taking one input, which is uh, the address where we are loading from, self. They take also the offset at which we are loading, but we haven't modeled the state of memory, right? So it wouldn't be the same if I put the, the load anywhere. I couldn't put, for example, the load in the branches for small integer because in that case, what we have is not really a pointer. We, are, we have an encoded small integer in the place of a pointer. So we have to be careful where we put some things, in special loads, stores, right? If we had the store, we couldn't put it anywhere. If the store was done before a load, then we, we could put maybe it in some other place before the load, but not afterwards. So we we should at least have some kind of dependency information. I added two more red arrows there that state, okay, so in, in what this kind of load depends. So in this, ca in this case, the load depends on the result of is tagged. If is tagged is false, then the load can be done, right? And if it's not, uh, if we didn't enter that branch, then we cannot do the is load. Okay, we have this, uh, we have this, uh, this graph, and we can still continue to do stuff, right? We have these basic blocks there, and we, for example, put the class offset in the same basic block that the load. But then, imagine what that what does that mean when we are implementing this model, right? So each instruction maybe points to its basic block or maybe points to the previous instruction in the same basic block, right? Or there's some way of storing the information of where all the instructions are put. Maybe you have that the basic block has an array of instructions. 
So if you want to optimize, what you want to do is to basically take all the nodes there freely, rep uh, respecting the dependencies, and then basically put everything where you want. So if, for example, something is not used, uh, but in a branch, you will try to put it there in, uh, in that specific branch. If something is in a loop, you might want to take it out, if possible, because it's a constant, for example. And you want to do all class of modifications to the code, right? So the idea of C of nodes, C of nodes was, this is important, I should have said it before, said it before, C of nodes was a term that was uh, coined by Cliff Click when doing his PhD thesis uh, and what became the base of the BH, sorry, of the, of the uh, Oracle's hotspot Java VM. And not all, not all of that VM because they have different JIT compilers, but the one that optimized most, well, that's basically uh, what Cliff did. And so, um, what does it mean to do a, a sea of nodes? Well, basically, you model as much as you need, but not more than that. So here we have, for example, that the that we are going to have a start node. We are going to ask, for example, if it's stacked, and then, well, the self node depends on the start. You have to be in the method to start, but you are going to model all the dependencies, right? So we are going to have these if true and if false nodes. We are going to have the merge nodes. And then, for example, in the case of the load, that load depends on self. It depends on the class offset. But you see that now the, the nodes are are basically free, right? You you can put them anywhere you want while re you respect the dependencies. So in this case, we have no particular order for the instructions or there is something hidden there, which is like a, a partial order. And when you finish processing your graph, you have optimized, and then you have to schedule the nodes respecting the dependencies. So you are going to build a new basic block, uh, sorry, a new set of basic blocks that respect all this information, right? But that's the idea of basic blocks. So when you have something like this, okay, so all these modifications that we have been looking at are all equivalent, right? So the, we are always representing the same information in different ways. Okay, so what can you do if you have this? Well, you can start seeing, okay, but small integer in one place is free and the other is free. So, well, we don't need to have two small integers and we, we don't have to have two is tag nodes because we can ask with once and all the dependencies are the same, are equivalent, so we can merge those nodes. Right? This is what a C of node uh, compiler provides to you. And, uh, well, basically, um, well, we are here. We haven't optimized the two loads. I actually have reached this point into my, uh, into my own implementation. I still have to, um, to find a way to express the, the fact, if you know, if you now look at the loads, well, they both depend on different if false branch, if uh, different if false nodes, and well, merging this kind of nodes is not uh, that easy. So I have to implement that. But if you can merge the if true and the if false uh, nodes that you have on the top and the bottom, then you will discover that both loads are the same, right? So when you start merging nodes that are, that do the same, you basically end with a program that doesn't have to uh, to do anything in this case because you will have something on one side, something on the other. They are the same. You can return true. Well, that's it. That's all the talk about C of nodes. So just um, some notes. So in the case of a traditional optimizing compiler, if you need to optimize, you trust you trust the control flow graph, all the jumps, you, you start from the start and then you optimize everything following all the closure of that. And usually you do many pass passes of analysis 
and uh, some information is implicit, like where this load, uh, or what memory is this load looking at? Can I can I make a store before that or not? Can I move things? Well, uh, basically, many information is implicit, and that's okay until you want to optimize. And you don't need to schedule because the graph is always scheduled. In the case of the sea of nodes, um, well, you can trust that all the dependencies express uh, what is needed for an instruction to be uh, executed. So if you if you want to move an, an instruction, you can do it as long as the, all the dependencies have been scheduled before. So you have to do a scheduling. And in, in this case, you will start from the stop node, from the end of the graph, the return, and you will follow all the dependencies. And if there are any nodes that you don't see, then they are not needed for the computation. So that's a pretty nice link. Um, well, uh, there's a lot of, of things to learn about that. So the good is that you, you will have an overall simpler implementation for the compiler uh, because you have to do less bookkeeping. And you can combine some optimization, which is it's good for the simplicity of the compiler too. Now, the difficulties there is, well, um, especially for iteration, you start from, instead of starting from the, the start, you start from the end. So in, all, in your compiler where you iterate, you have to change all the iterations of your compiler. And also there's a lot of things to, to read for example, for theory, you have the, the original paper, the original thesis. Then you have different representations like program dependence graph, well, about SSA, value dependence graph, value state dependent graph, regionalized value state dependent graph. There's, there's a lot of theory there, but there are not many implementations that you can look at and that are simple. So if you want to look at the code, then you have to go and fetch hotspot code, which is not a small code base. And you can see the same in B8. There are some other smaller projects which are nice, and they are now doing this simple C of Node compiler, which is a project that I think Cliff or Click is, is also working on, which is like a simple implementation of the C of Node so that people can understand it. So, well, uh, we are migrating our, our compiler to that. Um, Basically, uh, we have to change all the iteration uh, in the compiler and use it for different uh, targets. And so the, this, work, this work is open source. Um, we have this repo called powerlang-egg. Here we have this new kid in the town with a new dialect, which is open source, fully open source. You can find there the code of the small talk and also the code of this compiler. Um, so, if there's time, any question? The complexity in general of uh, when you travel the graph to check out the, the dependencies, a lot of that, uh, how, how, uh, how is that, the, the computational complex complexity? Well, it should be linear in the size of the graph. So, what, what you basically have to do is some kind of graph tra traversal algorithm and usually you have to uh, to do it in a particular order for example if you want to assign registers if you want to check if a variable is defined in some way or something like that you basically have to go through all the dependencies of that instruction until you find the point where you are satisfied maybe you have to do that and traverse the graph many times but usually it should be linear. So the compiler writers uh, take a lot of care on making their uh, optimizer be linear for dynamic languages because the compiler time competes with the program time. Thank you. Okay, thank you.